As I've thought about uh, being interviewed for this, naturally one thing I've thought about is how are people going to perceive me after this? Uh, are they going to think of me as some self-righteous, smug Puritan? Just because I've, I've found for me that this is the path that will lead to the most fulfillment of my life? I'm, I'm far more than that. I don't want to become a caricature. But people will think what they think. I can't control that. It's kind of a human thing to do, to just look at other people and assume things about them. For me, this is my journey. It, nobody else is going to have the identical experience. And so you can choose to believe or not believe. My experiences are true and valid. That's okay. I'd just ask you to keep an open mind. Consider that it might be possible that this is a genuine, authentic experience, and that it's possible for more than just me. There are a lot of reasons why I shouldn't be doing this. Matter of fact, any rational thought of the person that I've been my whole life would have said, you're not gonna do this. What are you gonna get out of it? On the other hand, I feel almost an obligation to be speaking to people I feel that I have been given hope, and I want to do that for other people, to give others the same hope. All right, guys. Are you nervous at all? Yes. Uh, well, this is very, very personal, right? But uh, that's true. I have spoken to crowds about the personal topic. Uh, maybe it's just it's a little bit of an unnatural environment, you know, kind of weird and haven't done the camera thing before, the lights, or I'm very rarely this made up. <laughs> uh, okay, and I saw myself in the mirror and I thought for a second, oh my God, she looks like she's in drag. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I decided as an experiment to go to a strip club. <laughs> I, don't, I, I can't recommend that to people. I ended up talking about uh, vegetables and, and gardening with the woman that wanted to get a lap dance. She said, oh, you like to garden too? Man. And I said, yeah, I don't like canning them. Well, freeze the vegetables. And so she gave me a pointer. She said, with a Ziploc bag, you just put it in there and you put a straw in and you suck out all the air and it's like a cheap little vacuum thing. So I still use that today. So I learned that from a, from a stripper on the way to Chicago. But what I realized, she was, she was not in any way an object of sexual desire for me. I, I basically got into the scene when I was 15 years old in Florida and ended up going to a gay beach and... Uh, what town was that? Miami Beach, 21st Street. And um, <laughs> there's so much to tell, but we're not going to go there. But, but you were starting to say, I went to New York and... Like, I just wondered how long it took for you. To, when you got to New York, you immediately got right into the scene then? Oh, yes. Before I moved to New York. <laughs> okay, that's what when I was saying. hitchhiking to New York, you know. Right. So I, you already knew about that. I discovered hitchhiking was a way to meet men and to get where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> I, our our uh, first uh, speaker, he's got, I know a little bit of his story. It has to do with uh, pirates and nuns and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and it's a rollicking tale. And um, I know uh, it, it's not easy to do this, so give him a huge welcome. Paul. Yes, it was really sex, drugs, and disco. 
Um, did I say rock and roll? I did say disco? Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure I got that. <laughs> Although I'm starting to appreciate rock now a little bit more. Uh, it was sort of like finding Oz, maybe. I don't think there was ever any place like it before. I was looking for that knight in shining armor, and I could start a whole new life, a gay life. The sexual revolution from the 60s was in full swing in the 70s, and Studio 54, especially if you were young, somewhat attractive, you could go there and it would be total heaven. The lights, the way people dress, the music, the movie stars, it just seemed like they want to rub elbows with us because we're so unusual and so entertaining. Um, it, it, was, it was exactly like you've heard. I hope everybody's having a good conference. Yeah, very good. Good, good, good. So I grew up in Pittsburgh. I came from a half-Catholic family. And that, what, does, what I mean by that is that um, my mother and all of her side of the family were Catholic, but my father was not. And I was pretty religious as a child. And, uh, but then I hit my teenage years, and I became very, very, um, I would say, covertly rebellious. I did not start out looking for women. I really wanted, at least I started out when I was in my teenagerhood, wanted to be loved by a man. But by the time I was out of college and actually got a job, I was very frustrated and couldn't understand why I wasn't being asked out. And uh, you really have to remember I was a lot younger and cuter and I should have been being asked out, you know? So I wasn't, you know, I couldn't understand it. I, I didn't know what was wrong. I mean, what did you expect that response to be? Yeah, I, I, I imagine the worst case scenario. There was that idea that this is like the, the untouchable subject. And if, if you're, you know, better to be a leper than to be attracted to guys. Right? That was a, I don't know where that came from or why I felt that, but I felt like there was nobody I could talk to about that at all. Certainly not my family, certainly not my pastor, certainly not my friends. But there, there's, a, there's a need to connect. You, you've got to get this out. And so, yeah, going online, right? That's the way to go. That's the way to, when the internet came when I was in college, you know, I could finally talk to somebody. I could finally connect, you know, and I remember Googling um, at one point, you know how Google suggestions, they pop up. I typed in, I am gay and, and then the Google suggestions came up. The first one at the time was, and I want a boyfriend. And the second one was, and I want to die. There were times I think, I never was tempted to suicide or anything, but there were moments when, you know, I, I, I was like, well, death would, wouldn't, wouldn't be so bad. You know, I'd be free of all of this. So what is cruising? Cru cruising is an art. <laughs> it really is. It is the act of putting yourself in a situation with wide open eyes, trying to meet another man. And I happened to be in Rome for business, actually, and one evening I picked up my little gay guide and I noticed that it said around the Colosseum, men cruise around there and it's a great place to meet men. So I went to, to the Colosseum and had the intention, of course, of having a beautiful night in Rome. As I'm paying the cab driver, I look out the window and notice that there are tons of people there. And I thought, Oh, how awful, another hundred people just got off of the bus and they're probably tourists looking at this Coliseum. There's not gonna be any cruising. And then suddenly in front of me, it was like an image of, that I can't really hardly describe. There was Pope John Paul II with this huge cross and 
I had forgotten it was Good Friday. When I saw that image of that man carrying that cross, it just took my libido away and um, it, 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 it changed my desire to do what I was there to do. That, that feeling was wonderful, but again, a few hours later, it got a little darker and I went to a different place to f go looking for the perfect Italian man. I had this idea of, of, of a relationship with God that was like a contract. If I was the good Christian boy, he would take care of these, he would take these attractions away, or he would make me attracted enough to a woman that I would be married, have a family, be like my parents, and have the picket fence and the dog. And basically all I have right now is the dog. And I'm very happy with her, but, um, but regardless, my view was, was a contract. And it was rooted in the Jeremiah 29, 11. So I just urgently and incessantly prayed that these attractions would go away, but they didn't. At a certain point, I started to realize that I'm just mad at God. If this is God's love for me, uh, I've, I've just, I'm done with it. Um, all these promises that you say you're gonna take care of us and love us, I'm not buying it. That's a bunch of hogwash. Yeah, so I went through this really dry spell of about three years and not one guy asked me out. I, I was started feeling quite desperate actually. Um, because I, I wanted a family, and I wanted to be loved, and I wanted to love somebody. I uh, moved back to my hometown of Pittsburgh, and I got involved with this choir group. And um, there was a young woman in the choir group, and through a series of circumstances at a party, she kind of started paying attention to me. And um, I pushed her off at first and said, you know, I'm not into that, I like men, da da da. But um, after a while, she was a little bit persistent, and then after a while I started thinking, well, a while was only a couple weeks, but I started wondering, well, you know, maybe this is who I am. Maybe she recognized something in me that I don't recognize in myself. Maybe this is who I am, and maybe this is why I'm not being asked out by men. Maybe I am gay. I just decided, well, I'm going to try this and see if it's see if it's who I am. And I did. And it was a little bit of a it was a very I will say this, it was a very powerful experience. Um, my next business trip took me to Phoenix and I found a women's bar there. And and I went and I um, met a lady whose name was Margo and uh, we started a relationship, and we were together for 25 years. So what was it about Marco that, that seemed to click? I think she was a lot like me in many ways. She was professional. She was um, and she wanted me, honestly. <laughs> And I, I needed to be wanted. I don't know when it happened, but there was a conscious decision where I said, I basically said, screw you to God, you know? I said, I am done with you. I couldn't, I couldn't, my rational mind couldn't justify gay theology. My rational mind and my faith and, and the world around me couldn't cause me to say God doesn't exist. Um, so I was confronted with this very specific choice uh, and I chose consciously to turn my back on God. There's this basilica in town, a basilica of the Saint Adelbert. That represented God to me, how he didn't really love me, how he just was this brutal little puppet master and, and who said, you're going to live this life and I don't care about your happiness at all, because that's the way I felt. And you know what? You've got to obey me just because I say so. And so every time I drove by, I'd see it and I'd just become seething with anger and I would just fly at the bird every time. You know, I don't know what people would think if they were driving by me, but I'd lean over and <clears throat> do that every single time for, for a couple years. There's no way that he loved me. There was no way that his plans were to prosper me and harm me. I thought, you're a liar. 
I wanted him dead. I decided to choose more glamorous careers, and, and the most glamorous career at that time for somebody like me was to be an international model. So I was lucky enough to get into one of the top agencies in the world and, and modeled in the United States and, and in Europe. And my life was basically about going to the gym, going to work, and every other free moment was spent deciding how I was going to uh, spend my life with my gay friends at discos and, or go to bathhouses or places where I could encounter men. It became frantic uh, and it was never my intention. And before you know it, you're going through dozens and then hundreds, and in my case, thousands of men, and becoming insensitive to, to what it really means to be with a partner, to both body and soul. I went as far away as I could. I went and, and uh, found a guy to have sex with. That's what I did. That was the first thing I did. So this guy I'd, I had been webcamming with for a while, I, the, the, the guy was in Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan is where I lost my virginity, the, uh, the murder capital of the world many years ago. <laughs> running, not the most romantic of destinations. And so I went in and, okay, this is finally, finally I'm gonna be able to do what I've always wanted to do. And uh, it was very blah, it's not, it wasn't, wasn't, you know, fireworks or anything. It was like, it's like very unmemorable except in the way that I felt after it. What was that? Yeah, I, I, I just felt just tremendous, uh, tremendous guilt and shame. I was driving back from Flint to Grand Rapids, just thinking, what did I do? You know, the guilt is, is, is something that says, I, I did something bad, I did something wrong. Shame, shame points to you. You look in the mirror and say, that person, you're worthless, you're bad. So we were together for 25 years. We really were both professional women. We made a lot of money um, and we had a, a very affluent lifestyle. We, uh, we bought lots of clothes, really nice clothes and shoes. <laughs> and um, vacations, we took vacations. We went to Hawaii many times. Marco loved Rome and Paris and Venice. Yeah. Yeah. Probably in the 25 years, we had at least 12 different, or maybe more than that, probably 15. We lived in 15 different places. You know, Marco claimed she had this philosophy that if a house got dirty enough that it needed a deep cleaning, it was time to move. <laughs> But I, I had enough self-respect that I said, I'm not gonna go out and become some promiscuous guy. I'm gonna go find a guy and date him. And so I, I did find a guy, and we, we were together for about a year. My, my relationship with Jason, that brought a lot of happiness into my life, to finally have somebody that you could just go through life with, you know, you could call when it was, something was bad, and I think that's what I had always longed for. Yeah, you ask me some more questions. Well, what did, uh, what did this relationship mean to you? Jason represented at least this notion of some healthy relationship, some normalization of like dating somebody, getting to know him, starting to share your life, find out what makes him tick. He, he finds out what makes you tick. That was fun. And it was, I, I felt like this 
I had somebody in my life to care about and who cared about me. And I thought that I would probably share my life with them. So we were living the good life. At one point in time, I was, we were living here in the Bay Area and I was, took a job that was in Atlanta and the company paid for me to commute every week or every other week to Atlanta. So Sunday night, I would fly to the East Coast and then work there Monday through Friday and then Friday night I would come back home and get in at midnight and we'd have Saturday and summer Sunday together and then I would do it all over again the next Sunday. And I can remember, honestly, I can remember sitting on an airplane on the runway in Atlanta multiple times and just tears running out of my eyes. Well, life in Atlanta was fairly empty for me, and you would have thought that I would be delighted to be going back to my home with Margot, but uh, it wasn't the feeling that I had. I was, I just felt desolate. At the time, I thought it was just my circumstances. That's just the job I had, so I, what I wasn't recognizing was that you design your life. We all design our lives. And we had both made choices about how we wanted to live. And oddly enough, our choices meant that we weren't with each other very much. There are more lives claimed, victims claimed, than, than toxic shock and Legionnaire's disease combined. And yet most of the country doesn't know about this cancer. Legion Why? Well, I think it's because it's a gay cancer. My lover at the time, we were living together, was one of the first 900 people in the United States to be diagnosed with AIDS. <clears throat> it was very amazing to me because he had only been out about a year and a half. We were all frightened to death. We thought we would be the next people in those hospital isolation wards and most of my friends, 90% of the people I knew, not even my, just my friends, but most of the people I knew in New York City in that era, 90 plus percent of them got AIDS and died. I can remember an experience that when we lived in Monterey County, it was a it was my birthday and I was in tears. Oh my gosh, I was just disconsolate. And I, I couldn't have told you what I was crying about. But um, it was probably the realization that I had moved beyond my fertile years and there were no children in my future and this was it. So I was out there and I said to the universe, I said, I know that I don't belong here but I don't have the strength to leave the material goodies. I don't have the strength to walk away from the material security. Money had become a very important thing to me. And so basically I was saying to God that the material things were keeping me in this relationship. And then he went about destroying our financial situation. <laughs> <laughs> because God heard that and within the next few years really wiped out everything that we own. I have no 401k, I'm up to my ears in debt. I, nevertheless, bad investments and all kinds of things took place. Um, it put a, a huge pressure on my relationship with my partner. And so things were getting worse and worse and more uncomfortable and there were job losses and there were bad investments and all kinds of things, and there was a growing tension between us. <clears throat> so how did things end up with him? <laughs> That's an interesting story. <laughs> it, was, it was about the time when, when I was really wrestling with how am I gonna tell my family. We've been together for a year, and, and it was a good relationship overall, you know? Um, and then suddenly I, I met this woman at work, um, and I found myself surprised that I was attracted to her. And so to find a woman 
who was attracted to me and interested in me and who I found attractive, that, that really rocked my certainty. It rocked, rocked this little world I was building. And the other aspect of it is it had, it had began to bring up all these things that I thought were dead within me. I had always longed to be a father. And I had, I had told Jason about the fact that I had wanted to be a dad, wanted to have a family. And I, we really loved each other. And I did not want to let him, I wanted him to know everything that was going on in my life. And so I, 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 I pulled him aside. I said, I said, Jason, I don't know what to do with this. So I, I, I met this woman. Jason did a remarkable thing. He pulled me close to him and he said to me, he said, Dan, if, if you can have those dreams, if you can have that life, I want you to have it. Basically, he loved me enough to, to see if those dreams that I had long been dormant could be fulfilled. And uh, that to me is, is a sign of self-sacrificial love that, that I'll never, never forget. In a way, I felt San Francisco would be a new beginning for me. It was just a little picturesque town, basically, compared to uh, New York City. I wanted to be somewhere else. It just seemed like death and dying was everywhere. Some friends said, well, you know, San Francisco is the same thing. And I said, yes, but I don't know any of those people. Yes, I met a wonderful man, his name is Jeff. Coincidentally enough, we had both lived in New York City. Coincidentally enough, we were both from Pennsylvania. And we seemed to have the same feelings about life. We had the same likes and dislikes. So he, he was just the perfect match. We met in San Francisco and he owned a home there at the time. And I owned a little cabin up in the Russian River. Sonoma County is so beautiful and in a, a step out of the city that we both decided that we would move up there full time. So things with Jason were over and you moved into this new cabin. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that life and what it meant to you. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was something that I, I stepped into very gingerly. I was really surprised to find myself attracted to her, right? especially considering the, 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 the time in the strip club, <laughs> you know. Um, I could talk about things other than vegetables with her. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, Kelly felt like a gift from God to me. And, and those dreams of, of having a family were resurrected and feeling like, okay, this is the Hallmark movie ending. We were rapidly um, verging on bankruptcy, really. Things got really tense. And then around 2008, there was a window of opportunity in California to get married for gay people. And I don't know if maybe Marco felt the tenuousness of our relationship or what, but she basically said to me, I think that Proposition 8, they, started, they were starting this Proposition 8 movement, which was to establish marriage as being between a man and a woman. And she said, I think this Proposition 8 thing is probably going to get passed. It looks like there's a fair amount of support for it. And if we're going to get married, now's the time to do it because the window is going to be closing. And, and I said, no. I can't marry you. Why do you suppose she asked then? I think that she wanted our relationship to continue, and I think that she saw that it was collapsing. And I think it was a little bit of a desperate measure to pull us together. Had the opposite effect, but um, sometimes that happens, right? <laughs> 
yeah, so I think it was maybe the first of her last ditch efforts to keep us together. And she moved to Fresno and I stayed here and found an apartment. So January of 2009, we were really officially apart. It, it was interesting because I thought I had the best of both worlds. I had Jeff. We were financially well off enough to not worry about money. We had a beautiful home on large acreage with incredible views. So I really thought we had it all. But I never stopped my, my prom promiscuity and my lifestyle. And I never think of myself or thought of myself as a lonely person. It was just there was something about a man that seemed like it would completely, it would, it would, I needed to validate my manhood by being with men. You were pretty happy with Kelly, yeah? Yeah, yeah. We were together for a year and a half and it was fantastic and I thought this is the woman I want to marry, but that's who we ended because Kelly just did not want to have kids. And uh, so we decided to take a break. It ended up being a long break, a year break, because um, I was still very much in love with her, but I really wanted to have a family. At the end of that year, I realized that my desire for kids was not, uh, didn't supersede, it didn't supersede my desire for Kelly. I was still in love with her, even in that year that we separated. So I decided, I made this, this decision saying, I want to share my life with Kelly. Well, she had moved on. She was already dating somebody else, and we had had such little contact in that year that I didn't even know that. And so it was devastating. When I was with Kelly, I thought, oh man, I'm on the other side of this. I'm a ladies' man. <laughs> and I realize now that's not really the case. Uh, I realized, I think it was her that I was really drawn to. The uniqueness of her and, and, and all of her beautiful way that she was. But she didn't represent every woman for me and still doesn't, you know? You sent us that thing you wrote about loneliness. Oh, that, 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 that one about that I wrote my counselor? Oh, that's depressing. I want to be able to know where you were at. Yeah, of course. I think loneliness is, is the most desolate state that the human person can have. Loneliness is not, you know, loneliness not, is not a state of, of your physical isolation. You know, loneliness is feeling that no matter where you are, that Nobody knows who you are. Uh, it's a strange thing to, to experience such isolation from people even though you're surrounded by them. And then putting on a happy face every day. It, that, all fell, that all fell apart in my late, late 20s, early 30s. Yeah, I couldn't keep up the facade anymore. Yes. What was that like after so many years? Well, I guess I have to say technically I wasn't alone because I got custody of the two cats. <laughs> um, the odd thing was there was, after 25 years, there was this habit of just turning to say, you know, <laughs> and nobody there, you know, that's a that was a weird thing, or, you know, sharing something about, funny that the cats did and uh, nobody to share it with. The living alone part was, it emphasized for me really that I had been lonely the whole time because I recognized what I was feeling as loneliness, but it wasn't unfamiliar. I had been lonely the whole relationship. For many years I decided not to get tested because I couldn't understand the reason to be tested. I already knew I was HIV positive and just to see it in writing would just be more painful. But a friend of mine told me that they had this new medicine called AZT, 
and it was one of the first or maybe the first medicine to hit the market that seemed to have some results. It, supposedly it could prolong your life a year or a few years. And so he said, you're crazy not to get tested if you want to live a few more years longer. And, and it made sense. I remember so clearly as I was driving down Dolores Avenue in San Francisco on my way to the clinic, I felt doomed. And then a ray of sunshine came through my sunroof and I, I felt a, a feeling of peace and comfort. And then I heard a voice and it wasn't a voice with my ears or anything like that. It was, it was more like mental telepathy. It came, it came from the center of my being, just this, this, this understanding. But I heard it in words, and, and the words said, Paul, you do not have AIDS because you have too much to do to make up for the way you have been living. And in an instant, from wherever it came, I knew that those words were true. And as they called my number and I sat in front of the doctor, he opened up the envelope and it was like magical. I looked at his lips and I could see them move what seemed to be like in slow motion as he said, you are negative. And I knew I had just been given a pardon from death. It was the most wonderful feeling in the world. And I think so. Clarifying is a good word. I think that it, it clarified the fact that here you are, you're 53 years old, your life is more than half over, you're living as a single person in, in a single bedroom apartment, you own next to nothing, and you have no kids, you have no husband, you have no home. Yeah. I started to look back on things and I thought, how in the world did I get there? What, what was I thinking? You know how it is with in a fog it's like there's a there's a feeling of almost intimacy in a way in a fog it's like uh, things happen in slow motion kind of almost and there's a different quality to the sound and so on and as I moved further and further away from the relationship that was the feeling that you had walked out of a fog or almost a dreamlike situation where I couldn't really put it together how I how I'd gotten there in the first place. So it was 83, 84, very early in our relationship, and we went to something back in the Georgia woods someplace that was called the Women's Fest. There were a lot of um <laughs> let's see bare-breasted women walking around and skinny dipping in the lake and the creek or whatever and um, so kind of in the next campground two women were um, I don't know how to say it they were loving on each other put it that way loving on each other and uh, and they kind of turned to face us and I was quite shocked uh, because they were identical twins. And I had kind of a visceral reaction. It was very, um, I, was, I was really shaken. And I said to Margot, are those twins that are making love to each other? 
And she said, yeah. And I said, do you think that's right? And she said, well, you know, if we start judging them, then people can start judging us. It was one of those points in time where my conscience was alerted to the point that I really, I had the opportunity, it was blatant enough that I had the opportunity to step away, uh, but I didn't. All I said was, oh, and I thought about it for a while and I just pushed that away. That's an interesting question. Uh, that that year and a half with with Kelly, God used in my life to convince me that first of all He loved me, right? Um, and then the year that we had apart, I really wrestled with the loss of her. And of course, I thought back on Jason. I thought about the other guys that I, I had met online so many times before. And, and um, there was that temptation to go back to that or that thought of going back to it. But I had reached a threshold where I realized, you know, the path to peace is this way, not going back. One of my favorite movies, Shadowlands. C.S. Lewis lost his mother as a kid, and that led him to turn away from God. He became an atheist, right? And then he lost his wife, Joy. And after she died, one of the scenes in the, in the movie, C.S. Lewis says to a friend, I've, I've suffered tremendous loss in my life. The boy chose safety, the man chose suffering. And it seemed to me that that's what God was saying to me. I started flipping off God. I ran away from him. And in some ways that was safe. Porn was safe. Talking to guys online was safe. I had that option after Kelly. Things didn't work out. But I decided C.S. Lewis was gonna be my inspiration. So I was gonna live in it. I was gonna consciously choose to figure out what the meaning was in that suffering. I, and I began to look at my whole life through that lens. So one afternoon I was watching television and after a hard night running around at the bars and I come across this image on my television screen and it was so strange that I said, Jeff, Jeff, come on in here and you got to see this. And so he comes in and I'm laughing mockingly at this nun with a patch over her eye, a distorted face. I didn't know she had a stroke at the time and a complete old fashioned habit. <laughs> it's a pirate nun. <laughs> Go swap the deck. <laughs> We both mocked her and laughed at her, and gosh, these crazy Christians. But as he left the room and I was about to change the channel, she said something so intelligent and so real and so honest that it really struck me. You see, God created you and I to be happy in this life and the next. He cares for you. He watches your every move. There's no one that loves you can do that. If you had a wife or a husband that watched your every move, you would knock them out. I mean, God. <laughs> You'd call him jealous. I can't move without him looking after me. Even before I connected with the counselor, I was coming to all these conclusions about my life 
and what I wanted from the rest of it. But so we had our appointments, and basically, well, it took probably about six months to get to a pretty good mm, level of trust, maybe. But about six months in, she asked me, do you believe in God? And I said, uh, yeah, I, I do. I believe there's a God. And in a way, I surprised myself as well. And then she said, well, you know, um, since you believe in God, you really have to understand that your primary relationship is with God. And if you don't have that relationship squared away, if it's not, if it's not a good relationship, then how can you possibly have other relationships that are, are good? And that really felt like truth to me. Peter denied his Lord, and Judas betrayed him. But Peter wept bitterly. She really had a big influence, a huge influence on my life, and I learned to love her. But at the same time, I had to hide her, sort of like having one of those blow-up dolls or something that you have to hide. It was, it was, just really funny. I was ashamed that I was watching a nun. And so when I turned the television off, I would always change the channel so that when Jeff came in or anybody else who turned that TV on, they would never see that I was watching Mother Angelica. And it reminded me, as I was doing this, of when I used to turn the channel when I was watching porn because I didn't want Jeff or anybody else to turn that TV on and see a porn station come up. I probably should have left the thing off about the blow-up doll. <laughs> awesome. So when I went to church for the very first time, I remember going up those stairs leading to the church, and I remember thinking when I go up these stairs that I should really look and make sure that nobody sees me because I felt in my heart, and I knew it was true, that I would lose friends and I would lose clients if they saw me going up into a Catholic church. Do you recall when you first went back to church? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, after that momentous conversation with my therapist, I, uh, uh, there was a, a church, I just Googled the church that was closest to the apartment, you know, and, um, checked out the masses and so I thought well there's an 8 a.m. mass on Sunday maybe I'll just go so like you do when you've been away for a long time I kind of slunk in <laughs> sat in the last pew and uh, shrunk down in my seat and nothing had changed really very much and I knew the responses and the prayers. At communion time, I felt the deepest urge to go and receive communion. And I knew I wasn't in a state of grace, so I didn't, but it was probably the strongest desire for anything I've ever had in my life. I looked up when confession was because I knew I had to go to confession. And the next week it was July 4th and um, nobody was in line, nobody's around, all the families were off on vacation. Thank heavens. And I went in and I knelt down and said those really such beautiful words. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been 35 years since my last confession. And I said, I don't really know how to go about this because there's been so much. Can you help me, Father? And this sweet, gentle priest, Father Bob, who has passed away since 
but he just took me through the Ten Commandments and asked me questions. And I was just flooded with grace and an overwhelming sense of gratitude. And it took about 45 minutes. <laughs> oh, but, um, yeah, I'll never forget it. So I went to confession one day. After having gone to, to church for a while, I thought, well, I'm going to go to confession. And when I went into that confessional booth, it was so frightening and so foreign to me and so against everything that I had believed for so many decades. But as I, as I kneel down in the darkness and I remember the words from, actually I went on the internet to make sure I was gonna say the right words, but basically it's about, forgive me, I have sinned. These are my sins. And because I couldn't I couldn't begin. I couldn't begin to name the numerous sins of my life over so many decades. And I'm not talking about a guilt because of my sexuality, because of my homosexuality. I'm just talking about what my lifestyle led me to be, my self-centered way, all about me, taking care of me, having a wonderful life at everybody's expense. I, I, I couldn't possibly begin to remember them all. So I went out the chicken easy way and I said, Father, I have broken all the Ten Commandments. And I didn't even remember what they were. And the priest said, including murder. And I laughed. And I said, oops, I forgot that was a commandment. No, Father, all of them except murder. And he was so kind and so polite. And said nothing negative to me at all, but encouraged me and said that only God could have brought me back. You know, I, I think my whole life, it, w it was a search for trying to understand myself and trying to find consolation, you know. I, I pulled this book of St. Clement of Alexandria off, off the shelf, and I read a line of his that he said, the, the commandments of God lead us to the blessed life. I thought, yeah, that's it. That's it. And it just rang through all the fog. God built into us a deep longing for him. Our longing points to the fact that we know we're not made for this earth. Yeah, I, I was driving by that basilica on my, on my way in today. And uh, that basilica symbols something more now. You know, um, that, uh, those three domes are a sign of beauty, and it's a harbor. You know, where once I, you know, threw it the bird, um, I now embrace it. I embrace the church because it's where I, I know that my peace is. So I look with longing and love at that. I, I just marvel at how good God is. I honestly don't know if there was a different path for me, realistically. And I don't want to, I also don't want to denigrate the relationship that I had with Margot. I don't want to denigrate anybody else's relationship. I think that we all have a 
deep, deep need for love. And we, we find that where it seems to fit most. Could you tell us um, how things turned out with Margo? So Margo passed away last August. Um, she had pancreatic cancer. She stayed with me for a while in the early part of, of this when she was deciding on treatments and figuring out what her options were. I told her she was welcome to stay with us the whole, the whole time, you know, no matter what happened. And so in the end, she decided to come back. And um, her brothers, a couple of her brothers, were able to come from Michigan. And they were there uh, for her last week. And then she died August 1st. I was glad she came to be with us. We meant a lot to each other. If she was gonna suffer, I wanted to help her suffer. If she wanted to die, I wanted to be there for her. I know it was a comfort to her to be able to spend her last little to spend her last time with us. It was really full of grace. It was, um, it was a peaceful time. It was a peaceful, it was a peaceful going away. And I wanted to make sure that she knew that even though I was turning away from the life, that I was not rejecting her and that I still loved her. I was very concerned what Jeff would think, especially when he found out that it wasn't just a passing phase. And my biggest fear was that he would give me an ultimatum, and that would have been very difficult for me. But instead, he surprised me and seemed to understand We've been together now about 24 years, and I can say, and I know he can say, that our relationship has only been better since I've become chaste and stopped my sexual activity. I'm still as much attracted to men as I ever have been. I still have uh, moments of loneliness and longing, you know? And I think to myself, I could maybe meet just this guy, this perfect guy, and uh, I might be tempted to, to turn my back on what I believe for a while, right? I don't want to ever pretend that I have that figured out or that I'm above that. I always think about chastity in terms of where I was miserable being unchaste. And unchaste living, it comes back so much to that I was perpetually looking in the mirror and it's all about me, 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 me. One of the good benefits of, of living a chaste life is, is you get outside of yourself and you start looking outward and investing in others. What would uh, younger Eileen think to see uh, church lady Eileen? She would laugh hysterically. <laughs> she would think it was ridiculous. Why? <laughs> um... Oh, you know, all that church stuff, that's just for people who are weak and people who can't get it together. 
people who are poor and sick and can't manage their lives. True enough. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> I was happy. I was in Toyland, um, in Never Never Land in New York City. Some of my most euphoric moments were when I was with beautiful and famous people in penthouses overlooking the spectacular skyline of New York City. And I've got to tell you that that happiness, that euphoria that would have lasted me a lifetime, pales, absolutely pales, to when I'm taking the body and blood of our Lord in church at Mass. Thank you. We're made for better stuff than what we settle for. And I realized my whole life I've settled. I don't want to settle anymore. And even if that means living a life that's single, I can do that. I don't want to go back, but I wouldn't rewrite the past either. Contentment comes with this sense of peace and well-being. And I have a sense about my life that I am safe and I'm home.